be seated. We'll stand in just a second. I want to give you an update. I want to uh, first uh, say what a privilege it is to be back in front of you, opening up the Word of God with you. Um, I also want to thank you for those that have been praying for Brother Sam Kennedy. Uh, he's a gentleman in our church back in North Dakota, and uh, he <clears throat> has stage 4 pancreatic cancer. He's a dear friend. He's um, uh, just... A, I don't really, he's a blessing. I don't know how else to say it. He is. But um, it, it's meant a lot that people here have been asking about him. So he, he will begin his chemo treatment next week. And we're praying that that will work. Um, we're praying that the cancer hasn't gone into the organs. It's still superficial. But it means a lot that you have uh, been praying for him. And uh, so thank you for reminding me to update mom. And, um, but so that, that's that. I'll keep you updated uh, along the way there um, for that. All right. So if you would take your Bible, turn with me to the uh, book of Psalms. And before we read our text, I want to say something just to help introduce why we're here tonight. Um, it's interesting. We sang for Rob tonight, Rob Acri, because he's part of the opening illustration. All right. Did you notice how extra Lila played happy birthday tonight. <laughs> I thought to myself, she must really, really like Laura. <laughs> anyway, um, no, Rob, of course, is a friend. Him and Lila are friends of Jen and mine, as many of you are with us. And uh, so, a couple years ago, Rob and Noel and Mark, I believe, uh, took me out to a restaurant called O Solomia, or O Solomia, and um, we talked on Sunday. And in the conversation, we said, this trip, obviously, it's not going to work out for us to get together, the four of us, but Lord willing, Jen and the girls and I will be back in June for revival, and maybe we can carve out some time to go out to eat then. And we chose to go back to O Solomia. Anybody want to guess why we chose to go back there? Oh, stop. You probably like Burger King. Okay, okay, exactly, very good, all right? Well, we go, we're going back there because the food is good, right? No one goes back to a place because the food's bad. It's like, hey, when you go back here and then you bring your friends there and you say, you got to try this, you got to try that. Anyone ever here ever done that before? Am I the only one? Okay. Yeah, you go back to places you like. Now, it's a really simple illustration, <clears throat> but it's kind of the spirit, only infinitely more important, of why we're in Psalm 119 tonight. Because I've been in this text before, I've preached this text before, but it has been such a blessing to me, and I hope that us going into it again, you will enjoy it as much as I have, and that the Lord will use it to bless you as He's done to others in the past. So with that in mind, would you please stand, Psalm 119. And we are going to be in, begin in the thirteenth stanza. The book of, or excuse me, the Psalm one nineteen is separated into twenty two different stanzas, each containing exactly eight verses. And the thirteenth stanza, beginning in verse ninety seven, I want you to see if you can notice anything unique about the punctuation in this psalm. Verse ninety seven: Oh, how love I thy law! It is my meditation all the day. Thou, through thy commandments, hast made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep thy precepts. I have refrained my feet from every evil way, that I might keep thy word. I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, tonight we come before you, Lord, very needy, but also, Father, uh, very grateful. Uh, we know that we have needs that can only be met in Christ. We know that we have needs that can only be met through the teaching and preaching of your word being made understandable by your Holy Spirit. But Father, we're grateful that that can happen. You've promised that your word will not return void. And Father, I know that Samson's folly was that he 
decided to go fight against the Philistines the same way he had done every other time before. And he tried to go out in his own might, in his own strength, and he failed miserably. And Father, while we've been in this text before, and I've preached this text before, I pray you'd help me to stay away from just trying to do what I've done before without your Spirit's help. Father, help me lean on you tonight. I pray you'd guide my heart, guide my tongue. I pray that this would be a blessing and an encouragement to your people. I pray that they would be strengthened and nourished through your word. And Father, we ask tonight with nothing wavering that you bless us with your presence, your help. And Father, we'll be quick to give you the glory for all that you will do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Most of you will know by now, I know you're a well-taught church, that the 119th Psalm has one theme. Anybody know what that one theme is? Anybody? The Word of God. It is the Word of God. The psalmist, 176 verses, and almost every one of them contains some form of a word or synonym for the Word of God. Thy law, thy precepts, thy commandments. This psalm is about God's Word. And while many of the psalms and some of the stanzas in Psalm 119 contain petitions, they contain requests, this one does not. There's not one question mark in this stanza, but there are three exclamation points. The psalmist is not asking God for anything for himself. This stanza is pure praise. No petition, but praise. But this stanza is also personal. You won't find we, the people of Zion, the children of Israel. This is I and my and you. Beloved, get in your heart tonight. A relationship with God is personal. And the word of God's value in your life should be personal. This is a relatable psalm tonight. Don't approach this tonight and say, well, that was the psalmist, or, you know, that was, uh, you know, David or Ezra, whoever they, they think may have written the psalm. That, that, that was those great men of God. I'm not like that. You absolutely, 100% have every right as a child of God to take the truths out of this psalm tonight and apply them to your own personal life. And I hope that you have a personal walk with the Lord. This psalm is pure praise and it is completely personal. I, he says, right out of the gate in verse 97, Oh, how love I thy law! Exclamation point. I love your word. I love God's word. And I hope that the same is true for you. And I pray that tonight you'd make this study real and you make this study yours. If you would go back a page or two to Psalm 119, I want you to look with two ver- at two verses with me. Verses 47... And 48, and I will delight myself in thy commandments, which I have, what? Loved. My hands also will I lift up unto thy commandments, which I have, what? Loved. And I will meditate in thy statutes. Hey, as I look back on my life, I can tell you this, I have loved God's word. Different word, though, in the verse we're looking at. It's not past tense. It's present tense. He loves God's word right now. In his life right now, today, he loves the law of God. It is present tense. And here's the thing that's convicting, beloved. The psalmist had less of God's word than we have today. And I just wonder if those of us who are privileged enough to have the completed revelation of God, the completed word of God, if I could say it this way, we have more of God's word, but do we love it as much as those that had less of God's word. You see the value tonight that the psalmist had moved by the Holy Spirit? This isn't hyperbole. This isn't just some emotional. This is real. The Holy Spirit wouldn't let it be preserved if it wasn't real. This man loved the law of God. He loved God's word. I hope that you, having the completed revelation, love God's word as well. Oh, how... I, oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. And you know what meditation is. The mole something over in your mind. You think about what you... As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. All the cross references we could look at. He says this. It is my meditation all the day. We recently had a young couple get married in our church. 
And I, I said to him when I was looking at this text, this is before they got married, I said, you think this is accurate that someone who loves something thinks about it all the time? And I said, you think that's true about Ashley? And he said, yeah, that's pretty accurate. Meaning, yeah, I think about her all the time. Why? Because he loves her. Now, it's true with people, but beloved, Christ who deserves the preeminence and his word who ought to have the preeminence, it ought to be that way in the believer's life. It is his meditation. It's what he thinks about all the day. Listen to what Charles Spurgeon said about someone's love for the word of God. Quote, if we do not love the Bible, we certainly do not love the God who gave it to us. If we do not love the Bible, we certainly do not love the God who gave it to us. But if we do love God, then no other book in the entire world will be comparable in our minds. When God speaks, it is the delight of our ears to hear what he says. In other books, there is some truth and some error. Apart from the Bible, the best book ever written has mistakes in it. It is not possible for fallible men to write infallible books. Somehow or other, we either say more than is true or less than is true. The most skillful writer does not always keep along that hairline of truth that is more difficult to tread than a razor's edge. But Scripture never errs. Here is the gold bullion without a single particle of alloy. Here is the living water leaping from the rock, and there is no defilement in it. We have heard of some who read their Bibles on Sunday, but put them away in a drawer with a sprig of lavender all the week. That was not David's plan. He could say, it is my meditation all the day. And no doubt he meant every day of the week. We must love God's word when we are at business and act on it there and love it in our families and act on it there. We must love the word so as to live on it wherever we may be. End quote. Amen to, amen to Spurgeon. Amen. It's true. What he's saying is this. The psalmist, you can feel it in this verse. He lives as if he cannot live without the word of God. Now let's make that relatable to us this evening. Don't answer this out loud, but answer it in your heart, knowing God knows it. How much of this past week can you say you lived according to the word of God? How much of this past week have you lived where you needed a precept, a principle, a truth, some direction, some commandment? How much of your life is attached to the Word of God? Beloved, I pray that all of us love God's Word enough to make it a part of every part of our life. You say, well, I don't know if it's not part of every, every part of our life. In the Bible is everything that pertains to life and to godliness. So the psalmist says this about the Word of God. It is the object of his love. You might say tonight, boy, I wish I loved God that much. I wish I loved the Word of God that much. I don't love the Word of God like I should. Well, I, I have some encouragement for you. You can increase your love for things. A spouse can increase their love for their spouse. A parent, their child, a child, their parents. How do we do that? Well, one of the best ways we do that is by spending time with them. My wife and I enjoy spending time with each other. But if we spend time with each other, let's say we go out to eat, it's not just the amount of time that matters to Jen as much as the quality of the time. This is nothing new. You understand this. So it's not just that I'm with Jen. It's that I'm paying attention to what she's saying. Now, apply that to your Bible reading. It's good to read your Bible, but you've got to pay attention to what it's saying. You have to engage the Lord as He is speaking to you. It's not enough to have it there next to you. We want to engage it. Increase your love for the Word of God by spending time in it and paying attention to it. Often, uh, people ask about worship. And I believe that one of the best things a believer can do in the assembly, gathered together, corporate worship, we'll get to personal in just a minute, one of the best things they can do as part of worship is give something. But don't think money. You can give money, that's good. But there's something else you can give God. It's what your friends want you to give them when you're with them. It's what your wife or your husband wants you to give them when you're talking to them. 
You know what God deserves when you're sitting in church? Your attention. Give Him your attention. Beloved, the psalmist, number one, about the Word of God, it was the object of his love. He thought about it, he meditated on it, he paid attention to it, and he, he lives as if he cannot live without God's Word. I pray that it's the same with all of us. But number two, and where we'll spend most of our time tonight, the Word of God is not only the object of his love, it is the source of his wisdom. If you're taking notes, stay with me on this one, because this is a really long point. Roman noble number two, or letter B, however you do your notes. It is not only the object of his love, it is the source of his wisdom, comma, by God's spirit and grace. I want you to notice verse 98 with me, please. Thou through thy commandments has made me what? Wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. Now, it does not say, this is very important, it does not say, thy commandments have made me wiser, does it? It says, you, through thy commandments, have made me wiser. You see that? There's a big difference. There's a big difference between having the word of God and having the spirit of God teach you the word of God. There are lots of false religions that have the Bible. There's a lot of false religions that have religious books, but not all religions have God himself. You remember Exodus and the book in the book of excuse me Moses and the book of Exodus when God said I'm tired of this I'm paraphrasing I'm not going with you I keep my word I'm going to give you a land that flows with milk and honey but I'm going to send an angel with you I'm not going to go with you I'm going to send an angel with you You remember Moses' reaction God no <laughs> we don't want that Listen other nations have milk and honey. Other nations have things. But what makes us unique is we have you. And if you don't go with us, we don't want to go. There was this realization of the necessity of God himself being with them. It's the same thing with the Holy Spirit. The Pharisees had facts, but they did not have the truth. They could open up the Hebrew Scriptures and point to some things that were true... But they did not have the truth because they did not know God. Beloved, do not underestimate the value and the privilege and the gift that you have if you're saved in the Holy Spirit living in your life. It is not just God's commandments. It is God through his commandments that made him wiser. You must have both. No one sits and well, I have a relationship with God. And so God and I have an If it isn't in the word of God, then it's not from God. God never leads someone to go contrary to the word of God. So you have both. And this psalmist understood that. He says, thy commandments with God, they're the source of my wisdom. With the, my, the source of my wisdom. He says here, thou, through thy commandments, hast made me wiser. I believe tonight would be a good time for you to remember the importance of God in your life. A lot of people like to quote the verse, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. But the problem in too many Christians' lives is we underline, I can, instead of the phrase, through Christ. The Bible says and is very clear that without Christ, we can do what? Nothing. We must believe that and understand that. We need the Lord Jesus Christ in every area of our life. John the Baptist said something that we all like to repeat. We've heard it said. It sounds good. He must increase and in what? I must decrease. And boy, it's easy for the he must increase, isn't it? The Lord deserves the preeminence. He must increase. But the hard part of that is the I must decrease part. But the psalmist understands, no, no, I don't have a part in this. Anything I have, any wisdom I have, any understanding I have, it's not because of me. It's because of you. He's praising God for what he has. This isn't arrogance. This isn't bragging. This is testimony. This is the psalmist saying, I know what I have and I know where I received it. It was from you through your commandments. I want you to notice, he says, I'm made wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. The question could be asked, what is ever with them? The enemies or the commandments? And the answer is yes. Right? It's both. Jesus wouldn't say, bless your enemies if you weren't going to have enemies. Isn't that deep? That, I mean, that's real. That's in the Greek. But also, God's word endures forever, amen? 
So the good news is, you're going to have the word of God forever. His commandments you'll have with you forever. And we praise the Lord for that. They are ever with me. But he says this, Thou hast made me wiser than mine enemies. And then I want you to notice verse 99, I have more understanding than all my teachers. Now, this is not, I don't think, a coincidence in the progression. Take your Bible just real quickly here and turn with me to the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs. I know you all work hard through the week and I so appreciate your being in church tonight. And, um, but you stay with me and I believe it will be, be worth it for you, all right? Proverbs 4, look with me at verse 1. Hear ye children the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also, and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. Oh, oh how important obedience is. Verse 5, get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get what? Understanding. The psalmist says, I was made wiser by God through thy commandments, and as a result, I also have understanding. But notice what he says. It's an interesting phrase here. Some of the school kids might have just found a new favorite verse. I have more understanding than all my teachers. But I have bad news. It doesn't mean what you think it means, right? It doesn't mean I'm smarter than all my teachers. It's actually a very important truth for all believers. What he's saying is, I have more understanding than just what I'm taught. I have more understanding than my teachers. And I want to tell you tonight, please listen to this very important Preaching and teaching should not be dismissed or diminished. God designed preaching and God designed teaching. But, as a believer, you better know more than just what you're taught. You better not only be in your Bible on Sundays and Wednesdays. You better know more than just what your pastor tells you about the Word of God. You need to understand what it means to learn from God through His Word yourself. You need to understand what it means to be led by God, to open up God's Word, to be spoken to by God. You have to have more understanding than just what you are taught. You need to know what it means to hear from God and learn from God. And beloved, this is so important today. I believe we're living in a time, I said this to you back in June, I think it was in June, during the revival, that we are living in a day where it is more possible now than ever before to heap to yourselves what? Teachers. Teachers. Podcasts, YouTube, online. You can find anything you want. Oh, I, I, I'm going to listen to this. I'm going to listen to that. And there's nothing wrong with listening to good teaching. I think that's a very important thing. But be careful. Oh, be careful who you learn from. This book is the authority right here. This is the authority. And there is no substitute, no, no, no matter how well-meaning the author may be, there is no book that is a substitute for God's book. There's a reason it's called the holy book. The word holy means it's set apart. There's not a book like it. And so don't fall into the trap of parroting what people say that you found online or parroting what your favorite author may say. You should have more understanding than just what you're told to learn. You need more than Sunday and Wednesday. You need more than just the preaching and the teaching from others. You need the Lord. You need the Lord. You need to be able to say from a genuine heart, Lord, you, through your commandments, have made me wiser. Now, remember, it doesn't dismiss preaching and teaching you ha because he does have teachers. You see that, right? That's good. So this isn't saying you don't need... God designed the assembly. God designed preaching, preachers, teachers. But we're, we're good on that? Okay, but there's a balance. You need to be in the Bible yourself. So I have more understanding than all my teachers. For thy testimonies are my meditation. It's not a, a, a website. It's not a devotional book. 
It's God's word himself. That's what his meditations are. And that's what allows him to be wiser than his teachers. A personal relationship to God depends on personal devotion with God. A personal relationship to God depends on a devotion with God. You need to, you need to know more than you're taught to know. And then he says this, I understand more than the ancients. Because. Every time you see that word, understand there's cause and effect. There, something happened because something else happened. And now he says, I, I know more than I'm taught, but I also know more than the aged, than the older ones. Now, please listen. This is not teaching to dismiss the elders. This is not teaching to dismiss those that are older than us. That would be foolish to dismiss those that are older in years and have more experience and wisdom from, from the Word of God. It would be foolish to dismiss that. But what he says is, if you do what he does, have you ever heard the expression, wow, that person's wise beyond their years? You ever heard that expression before? Well, the psalmist gives you the secret to how you can be wise beyond your years. When you, you can be as wise, if not wiser, or more understanding than the ancients, because I keep thy precepts. That's the cause. I keep thy precepts. What's the effect? I have more understanding than even those that are older than me. The key is obedience. Understanding more than we should is attached to obedience, and obedience must be attached to the Word of God. Let me show you a really uh, specific illustration of this in Scripture. If you would take your Bible, turn to 1 Kings chapter 13. 1 Kings chapter 13. For time's sake, I'm not going to go through the whole account, but the Bible tells us in verse 1, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And the man of God, this is verse 2, and he, being the man of God, cried against the altar in the word of the Lord. That's a good thing for a man of God to speak, is the word of the Lord, amen? The man of God should speak the word of God. O altar, altar, 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 2. O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt unto thee, and he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand which he put forth against him dried up, so that he could not pull it in again to him. Talk about an awkward moment. Get that guy! And all of a sudden, he couldn't even pull it back to his own body. Right there, it paralyzed and dried up, atrophied in front of everybody. The altar was rent, the ashes poured out, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. Now notice verse 6. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me, that thy hand may be restored me again. And the man of God said, Tough luck, pal. You reap what you sow. Is that what the man of God said? No. Robert Murray McShane said this, and it fits not just men of God, it fits all Christians. It is a sure sign of grace to desire more. It is a sure mark of grace to desire more. Meaning, let's always look for ways to be more gracious than we already are. And how gracious of this man, who had just been railed against by the king, threatened with arrest, and he didn't say, no, you can, you can figure this out on your own. You know what he did? He prayed for him. What grace this man of God had. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again and became as it was before. And the king said to the man of God, now here's gratitude, and I think it's pretty obvious. I don't think that there's anything wrong with gratitude. Come home with me, refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. And the man of God said to the king, it worked. That's not what he said. Because he wasn't doing it for a reward. Look what he says. If thou wilt give me half thy house, I will not go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place.
For so it was charged me by what? The word of the Lord. God had already told him what he should and should not do. And God said, eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way thou camest. So he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. Now you show me a man that is confident enough in the word of God that he can stand up to a king and he can turn down a kingdom and wealth and clothes and a new residence. And I'll show you a man that has a strong conviction on the word of God. I mean, that's a pretty impressive thing. Hey, king, I appreciate what you're offering me, but God said not to do it, so I'm not doing it. That's some strong conviction. But the story doesn't end there, tragically. The next verse, verse 11. Now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works the man of God had done that day in Bethel, the words which he had spoken unto the king. Then they also told their father, and the father said unto them, What way went he? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, which came from Judah. And he's like, all right, well, let's go get him. I want to to know who this guy is. Look with me, if you would, please, at verse 14. He went after the man of God, found him sitting under an oak, and said to him, Art thou the man of God that came us from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said unto him, Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, Man of conviction, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by what? The word of the Lord. Thou shalt eat no bread nor drink water there, nor turn again to, the, to go by the way thou camest. He said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spoke unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. Now, what, what, remember the old adage from the Christian school, young people? If man says something different than what God's word says, man is wrong because what? God's always right. And here's this man of God with a conviction enough to stand up to a king. But here comes another prophet, another man of God. Hey, we're all the same. We all believe the same. We're all Christians. Hey, you know, I know all about that. And they want us to do something that we already know the Bible says not to do. They're wrong because the Bible's right. And if I or you said something different than what the Bible says, I or you are wrong because the Bible is always right. Tragically, this young prophet disobeyed the word of God. And you know what happened? He died. God killed him. Now, why is that? Not because God is an unjust God, because God takes his word seriously. That's why. This is why the psalmist said, to that, that old young prophet's a good example. Hey, you want to be wiser than the old prophet? Obey God. You want to be wise beyond your years tonight? Obey the word of God. I don't think we understand how significant it is to just simply obey God's word. Go back with me to the psalm. I want to show you one more progression here, and then we'll move on. Psalm 119, look with me again. Look with me at verse 98. He says, speaking of his commandments, they are ever with me. Verse 99, they're my meditation. Verse 100, I keep thy precepts. You see that progression? I have the word of God. I study the word of God. I obey the word of God. That word keep means to guard with the intent to obey. It means to protect it. Why? Because he knows how special they are. Let's Let's look at that again. I have the word of God. I study the word of God. I obey the word of God. Now, I don't want you to raise your hand, but how many of you have the Word of God? Probably all of us would raise our hand. How many of you study the Word of God? Maybe less would raise their hand. How many of you obey the Word of God? Maybe fewer would raise their hand. I hope that's not the case, but I'm just saying that's tragically how it often goes. But beloved brethren, these things ought not so to be. See, what does this have to do with love? Remember what Jesus said? If you love me keep my commandments. That's how important obedience is to love. I have your word. I study your word. I obey your word. And beloved, I'm saying this is not the psalmist bragging on himself. This is for you tonight. This is for you tonight. This is God's word. It is the object of his love. It is the source of his wisdom. By God's grace and spirit, he is 
wiser than his enemies. He has more understanding than his teachers. He has more understanding than the ancients. But third, and lastly, it is the motivation for his sanctification. The word of God is the motivation for his sanctification. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 9 that those believers turn to God from idols to what? To serve the living and true God. The psalmist has the same intent in mind. Look what he says here. Verse 101. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that. Here's why I did that. I might keep thy word. I have refrained my feet. I have stayed away from every evil way so that I could obey God's word. Notice verse 102. I have not departed from thy judgments for thou hast taught me. The first two words of verse 101, I have. The first three words of verse 102, I have not. If you are a child of God, you better know the things you are supposed to do and you better know the things you are not supposed to do. I have refrained, I have not departed. He says, God's judgments are too important for me. I want to obey God's word too much. Here's a verse that many of you young people memorize as a child. Same, same uh, Psalm 119, verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart. Why? That I might not sin against thee. It, it matters to the psalmist. I don't want to offend God. I don't want to hurt him. I don't want to disobey. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And he says, here's what I'm doing. If I see an evil way, I'm not going to go over there. And if I have God's judgments, there is no way I'm departing from it. And if I could say it this way, if, if you were, if you somehow fell off a, a, a boat leaving New York Harbor, and all that there was out there was a buoy, a buoy floating up and down, and you swam over to that buoy, and you grabbed hold of that thing, what are the chances of you letting go? Well, if you want to live, probably not very good chances, right? You're holding on to it. You're not letting go. This is the urgency the psalmist has here. I have not departed from thy judgments. I have been tempted to depart from your word. I have been peer pressured to depart from your word. But I have not departed from your word. Why? Well, he tells us, for thou hast taught me. Here we go again with a personal relationship. It, Lord, because you're the one that taught me. If you were to go to my house when I was younger, my mom had a, a, a hutch that had dishes from my grandmother, or maybe my great-grandmother. My great-grandmother, she had dishes in there. She had some like more expensive silverware in there. And then she had a plastic plate that was ugly, horribly ugly it had Crayola marker big fat marker on it it had a turkey that had been made out of my traced hand as a first grader in Mrs. Hinkle's class happy Thanksgiving mom love Josh 1985 and I, I always said it would be a great diet plan because if that plate was in front of somebody they'd say I'm not hungry anymore I mean it had it had green and yellow and red. It was, it, was, it was not a nice looking plate. But why did my mom have it in there? It wasn't because of what it looked like. It's because of who gave it to her. It was because it was her son's. Now, I realize that an ugly plate is not the best illustration for the word of God. But I hope you understand the principle. The psalmist's attachment wasn't to a thing. It wasn't to a book. It was to something he had received from God. Lord, I'm not, I'm not departing from this because you gave it to me. You taught me. I hope that you understand how precious it, is, precious it is to have a personal relationship with God. I'm not departing from your judgments for you have taught me. Thou has taught me. He doesn't want to depart, not just because there's blessing if he obeys, but because of who has taught him, it's the Lord. He continues on in verse 103 and 104. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Isn't that beautiful? Now, it's true 
Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so if you have God's word in your heart, then you speak truth. And there's a good truth there about wholesome words. But this isn't what he's saying. He's not talking about what he speaks out. He's talking about what he ingests. And he says, man, the word of God, it tastes like honey. It's sweet like honeycomb. I'm telling you, it is so, so good. You can tell he really enjoys the word of God. He enjoys sweets. And that's why he doesn't say broccoli. Right? He doesn't, it's, hey, I'm just reading the Bible, amen? It says, thy, how sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. You might ask the question, how could a person not think the Bible is sweet? How could the person not want the Bible in their life? Well, the Bible gives us that answer. If you take your Bible, turn to Proverbs 27, and I want you to look at what Solomon says, moved by the Holy Spirit, Proverbs 27, and look with me, at verse 7. The full soul loatheth a what? A honeycomb. You know what the word loatheth means? Hates. I don't want it. I don't, it's despised. It makes me sick. A full soul loatheth a honeycomb. You've been there. Man, I am stuffed. I can't eat another thing. And here's your answer to why some people do not love and do not read, do not want to hear the word of God itself. That which is sweet to the believer's taste buds, the believer's, the believer's appetite desires the word of God. It's sweet to our taste. And yet there are people who dismiss the word of God. They reject the word of God. They don't want the word of God. You know why? Because they're full already. They're full of entertainment, they're full of television, they're full of music, they're full of work, they're full of career, they're full of family, they're full of the world. They don't want it. I'm full, and a full soul loathe even a honeycomb. I pray that God works in your heart tonight and allows you to see the value of the Word of God. I pray that if there's a child of God here tonight that looks to Scriptures, that you would have that same desire it's sweet like honey. I'm reminded of what Paul told the saints at Rome as he ends his book. Romans chapter 16. Don't turn there. I'm just going to quote it for you for time's sake. He says this. That God's desire for us is to be simple concerning evil. Remember that? Simple. That means if anyone on this earth is going to be an expert on evil, it shouldn't be the Christian's. And yet the world has made evil, immorality, murder, violence, debauchery, all, I mean, you name it, it's out there. They have made it so accessible. All you have to do is open a phone, turn on a television, listen to your radio. And I'm not saying these things are individually bad, but you better be very, very, very careful, especially with young people. Because we're supposed to be simple concerning evil, but wise under that which is good say, well, how can I dilute the pollution that's in the world? I mean, I go to work, I hear garbage, I see those things I don't want to see. Well, you can dilute it with that which is good, that which we're to be wise about, and that's right here. You're not going to get more good than this. And so the psalmist says, how sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I hope you're not filled with what you shouldn't be filled with. Fill your heart, fill your mind, fill your soul with the Word of God. And then lastly, and we're done, he says this, instill the, the attitude of his sanctification, his desire to be set apart for service to God. He says in verse 104, Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I what? Hate every false way. Now this is a really interesting way to end this stanza. Because he started this way. Oh, how I love thy law. And he ends with, I hate. How do you do that? How do you start with, I love, and end with, I hate? I want you to stay with me because it's going to sound really uncomfortable, what I'm going to say, but it's, it's Bible-based. When you love the right things, you will hate the right things. When you love right, you will hate right. The psalmist loved God's word, and because he loved truth, he hated anything that was opposed to truth. He loved the way we have Jesus himself now who is the truth. 
He loves the way, the truth, and the life. And a Christian, a child of God, will hate, despise, look down upon anything that would hinder people from hearing the truth, anything that would change the truth, and anything that would keep you from the truth. We'd hate it. We don't want it. I don't want that in here. And may I say this to the church? That is a pillar and ground of what? A pillar and ground of truth better hate every false way. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm reminded, as a closing illustration, of a shepherd. Shepherds love sheep, amen? And because they love sheep, they hate wolves. And if a shepherd ever killed a wolf and someone saw it, how, how, how silly it would be to say, oh, why do they hate animals so much? What do you say? They don't hate animals. They love sheep. And because they love sheep, they're going to do anything they can to protect those sheep. Even if it means killing a wolf. Because when you love right, you hate right. You love God's word, you're going to hate every false way. And there is no greater example than Jesus himself who was in that temple, and he loved what God's house should be. And he cleaned house with what shouldn't be in God's house. And the disciples sat back and they said, man, this reminds me of that psalm. <coughs> excuse, <coughs> excuse me. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Remember that? No, notice what the disciples did not say. Boy, Jesus really hates money changers. Well, Jesus really hates furniture. They didn't say that because they knew that's not what's driving him. It's not his hatred for that which is wrong. It's his love for that which is right. But because he has a genuine love for that which is right, he's going to get rid of anything that's wrong. I hope that every person in this church has that same attitude about this church. That if we're going to be a pillar and ground of truth, and we're going to love right and we're going to hate right. We're going to protect what God's given us. We're going to steward what God's given us. And if it ain't in the Bible, if it's a wrong spirit, if it's a wrong attitude, if it's a false doctrine, we don't want it. That's the whole idea. This is the psalmist. I love right, which means I'm going to hate right. Oh, how love I thy law, and I hate every false way. I hope tonight, with, God, with the Lord's help, you saw a pattern for you about the Word of God. I hope tonight that the Word of God will become in greater ways the object of your love. I hope it will become the source for your wisdom by God's Spirit and grace because you're not getting it without Him. And lastly, I hope what you have in the Word of God is the motivation for your sanctification considering who gave it to you, considering who you're going to give an account to, and considering what it means to have truth. Father in heaven, thank you again for all you do for us. Thank you, Lord, for preserving these psalms. And Lord, I pray that something said tonight was an encouragement to your people. I pray that it grew a love and an appreciation for your word. I pray it grew a desire to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray that... There are people here who will not settle for just having knowledge, that they will desire wisdom and understanding. I pray they would not be content to just sit and listen to someone else talk about your word. I pray they'd dive into their Bible this week and they would study it and they would get to know not only it, but get to know you better. And Father, I pray that it would be something used by you in their life to sanctify them, to keep them holy, to stay close to you and to stay close to truth. And Father, I pray also for those that are here or watching online that are not saved. I pray, Lord, that you would allow them to realize they've been filling their minds and their hearts and their souls up with all the junk of the world. I pray, Lord, that they would turn to you in repentant faith. You'd clean their heart out of all that, give them a brand new heart that will love you and love your word. We'll be quick to give you the glory when you do it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.